We are back into the <clears throat> sermon series that we've been on regarding discouragement. And i um, going to talk to you today really very pointedly uh, about one particular point. And we're doing this as we lead into a time where we partake of the Lord's Supper, which is, um, again, to us, an, an apex of um, remembering, of self-examination, of spiritual growth, uh, of spiritual conviction. And today I believe that today's message on um, this part about discouragement will flow directly into that in a very powerful way. We're going to be again in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Um, we're going to be looking at two verses mainly. Uh, it'll be verses 1 and verses 4, and we will be talking about um, the necessity of obedience and the fact that sometimes we undervalue obedience when it comes to a time of discouragement. Um, I know in my life, I, again, I liken it unto this, it's not always going to be uh, peaches and whipped cream, it's, it's just not. But I'm finding this, that God will give us sustaining grace and he'll give us strength to you that, you that you never knew you had. And what you find is that during that time that God's still in control, that God is not the one who gets discouraged. And that this earth is going to throw at times of us uh, discouragement, it's going to throw harsh things, sometimes calamity. But I think we undervalue the basics of obedience. And today I want to talk to you, if you're dealing with discouragement, I want to encourage you not to undervalue the uh, strength of obedience. If you've got your copy of God's Word, we invite you to stand to honor and to reverence the reading of God's holy and inspired Word. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, look in verse 1, and then we'll look, to, we'll look at verse 4. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. I want you to look in verse 4. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we stand to reverence your word, we, we do this to show our respect and our submission. And we pray that, Heavenly Father, today you would speak to our hearts in regards to obedience. And again, pr prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper. I pray that today, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today will be their day of salvation. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would add to your church, add to your mission here, Heavenly Father, as we seek to lift you up, Lord Jesus, in this community and further out as you so give, uh, give the opportunity, Heavenly Father. We love you and we want to hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you will remember a famous person by the name of he Helen Keller. And a uh, very difficult situation. Helen Keller was not able to speak, to hear, or to see. And God sent to her a special person by the name of Ann Sullivan who tutored um, young Helen. And Ann said this, if, you, if you've ever seen the movie you kind of that they made about it, you are going to realize what I'm talking about. This was a very tough circumstance. But Ann Sullivan said this, I, I saw clearly it was useless to try to teach Helen any language or any type of communication or anything until she learned to obey me. I have thought about it a great deal, and the more I think, the more certain I am that obedience is the gateway through which knowledge, yes, and love, too, enter the mind of a child. I believe that there's the misconception that when God calls us to an obedience and we hear, thou shalt not, or either we're supposed to do something that is against the flesh, that's challenging, I think, I know the outside world compares it to, you know, it's just this list of what to do and what not to do, and God's sitting up there, you know, ready to kind of zap you down when you mess up. The truth of it is, God shows his love to us in obedience. Now you say, well, how does, 
how does he show me love through the obedience? Well, remember that we're given a model by which to follow his name being the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll remember, especially in Philippians chapter 2, it talks about that the Messiah said he became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So God has given, the, given his son to us to show us a model of obedience. And yes, it's when times are good, and yes, it's in t- when times are bad, and yes, especially, I would say, in times of discouragement. I believe what we do is we undervalue obedience. Now, if you are in the midst of a storm, typically, we tend to, and all of us do it, we kind of go the route of, of the whiny or either the why me, Lord, or even some, even some that are, are maturing Christians, you know, uh, would say, what can I do different? What can I be that is going to get me out of this spot? I'm beginning to look at things just a little bit different through some of my own personal circumstances and see that what God is desiring is not so much that we get out of the spot that we're in or get out of our circumstances or our discouragement or our, tri- or our trial or the tribulation or whatever the case is. I believe what God calls us to is a prayer life to Him, devoted to Him, a focus on Him during the trial, and an obedience to Him in that time to be and do what He calls us to do. And these things shall pass. How many times throughout God's Word do you see, and it came to pass, and it came to pass, and it came to pass? There are seasons that we're going to go through that are uncomfortable for all of us. And I'm finding, though, that God will use those times to teach us some of the most precious lessons. But if we're not obedient, we fail that, and we're probably going to have to repeat that test. We're going to have to repeat that trial. Because God is in the process of shaping us to be conformed to the image of His Son. And and obedience is what God has required. So we're going to be talking about today, don't undervalue simplicity of obedience. We've used this passage of Scripture as kind of our our springboard through the series. I told you that Samuel was heartbroken over Saul's decision. Um, He had gone against God's command in terms of the king uh, that he refused to wipe out and also some of the things that they took they were not supposed to take and things like that. And it really was an arrogance issue for Saul if you boil it down just right. And Samuel has been in mourning for Saul. And God visits him and says, look, I have, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? How long are you going to keep this up? Seeing I've rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil and go. And we talked about that. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among my sons. But here's the verse that I really want you to camp out on. And it's the first part of verse 4. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. It doesn't say in there that Samuel quit mourning. It doesn't say that he quit, he, he was stopped worrying. It doesn't say that the discouragement went away in this text. And I believe that we as Christians sometimes treat the discouragement like, when this passes, then I will get involved in church. Or when the discouragement passes, I'll get back to walking with the Lord. Or when the discouragement passes, then I'll pick up my Bible and read. Or when the discouragement passes, I'm going to go back to the Lord and strengthen my prayer life. And when, and when, and when. Let me explain something to you. Never put off a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You need Him so much on a daily basis, regardless of if you're on a high or if you're on a low. And what you find through that time of testing, if done correctly, is that God had a lesson for it. God also had a purpose and a plan for it, as we've talked in the weeks past. But you're also going to find that God has a a certain plan for you through this. And if you will be obedient, God is going to see you through the other side of that. And only He can make something that is so broken so beautiful. 
we miss out on it so much of the time because we buckle under it and we forget to be obedient. And by the way, I'm going to say this too. This is going to sound at first uh, almost an unspiritual comment, but I, want you, I really do. I, I want you to take this to heart and really, really just consider it before you give me some complaints on it. There is a time where we do mourn and a time to dance. Ecclesiastes tells us this, correct? And I would say that according to the same passage in Ecclesiastes and according to this passage right here, written for our learning, it's, that, it's not that we ever cease to pray. We know we're supposed to be in a spirit of prayer and walking in the Spirit constantly. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm going to tell you, there's a point where you get off your knees and you do something. I'm not saying that you throw away your prayer life. By no means. Again, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And as a matter of fact, it says right before that in verse 16, rejoice evermore. It doesn't say rejoice unless you're discouraged. It says rejoice evermore. And the concept of what I'm trying to tell you is this. We treat the trial like when this passes, this will be okay. But we're not seeing what God is doing in it, and we tend to miss it. And we say, okay, I've just got to, for lack of a better term, I've got to hold my breath till this passes, and then when it passes, I'll get back on track. And the whole time, God is saying, I have something in the middle of this that I'm doing. Even if it is satanic attack, even if it is a spiritual, because we know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We know that this is the case. But even when it's Satan that has gotten in the middle and be, become the accuser of the brethren, the great deceiver, the father of all lies, that he is. God can still take that kind of situation and make it into something wonderful if we're obedient to Him. Satan can never have the victory when a child of God is abiding in Him. He can never have the victory. And it's not a thing about He can take it away from you. He can steal the glory. He can steal the victory. No, no, no. You don't understand. God is going to win this battle. The end of it's not settled. You say, well, this situation has been ongoing. I've never seen the victory in this. Well, maybe God has a time and a season for it, and maybe He's bringing things around, and there is going to be that, but you can't lose the hope. You can't lose the faith. And by all means, you can't lose the obedience. Because when you do, you will fall away. And it will cause and give root to bitterness, to hate, to envy, to jealousies, to all these other things that are the opposites of the fruit of the Spirit. Samuel said something in 1 Samuel 15, 22, and, and several weeks ago I read it. I didn't get a chance to teach on it very much. But you remember King Saul had said, well, we were going to sacrifice some of those animals that we shouldn't have taken. We were going to sacrifice those to the Lord. You remember all of that? And we... Yeah, you know, he was, first off, he was lying about it. Second off, he didn't obey God. Then he decided, that he first tried to blame the Israelites for it. They wanted to do it. Uh, but then after all of that, he tried to turn around and make it spiritual. By the way, don't, this is a, I don't need to go down this rabbit trail. Don't spiritualize things and lie about God. I mean, really? Saul was saying, hey, we were going to offer these up to the Lord. He wasn't no more worried about offering those to the Lord. And Samuel knew this. Of course, God was speaking through him. And listen to what he said. This was in 1 Samuel 15, 22, if you're taking notes. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken to the fat of rams. He's saying this, look. You can, you can say that you're going to do these big, great things, but if you're not obedient in the little things, the sacrifices are not going to get you out of hot water with God. And I know at times in my life when I either didn't have as much to give, or I, whether it's financially, physically, whatever, sometimes... I would feel so inadequate at what I had to give 
Because it's say, God, I'm going to give you what I got. It's not much, but I'm going to give you what I got kind of thing. I'm going to tell you something. When you understand stewardship through a Christian worldview, which is what we're talking about on Tuesday nights, not just stewardship, but the whole of life. When you look at it through a Christian worldview, you understand that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God, when it comes to something like tithing, giving offers, it's not a thing that God is needing your money. But I don't, I, where did that come from? That is so against Scripture. And I'm using something delicate with money, but it's everything else in our lives. But we say, well, I'll give this big offering when income tax time comes or whatever else, when it's easy for me to give, but I, I don't give, you know, uh, during the year. I'm going to tell you this. You can come up with any lump sum of money that you say I would like to give at that time and give it comfortably. But it's better to obey rather than sacrifice. God would rather have you obey week to week to week to week to week. This is not just tithing, folks. This is like some people say, well, I'll wait till I get my life right with Christ and then I'll be the person that talks to others when we're in the post office about Christ. No, no, no. You, you be consistent now. And sometimes I see people who try to come on the scene as super Christians, and what they do is they'll, they'll do some kind of sacrifice that looks really good, and then you're looking around in a month or two, where, 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 where'd where they go? What, what, did, what, what happened? And I'm afraid that it's just starting in the pulpit. Because preachers are not getting up anymore and challenging the people that what we're supposed to be living as Christians, as Christ followers, is a consistent life. A life of obedience. A life that is a sacrificial, that we do give. And yes, I'm even talking about financially. I'm even talking about time. I'm talking about your talents. I'm talking about everything that you can bring to the table to glorify and lift up the Lord Jesus and also to edify the church that we may do His work together. But you see, if we put any kind of conviction out there and tell people you're supposed to be holy week to week, you're supposed to obey week to week, you're supposed to give week to week, you're supposed to pour yourself out week to week, it challenges the people and that's just too much for us to do. I think back to the early church, though, and like Hebrews has said, you know, they, there was a point where they had not yet resisted to the point of blood. And, of course, obviously it, it, it went to that. This statement is so hard for me to make, but I can't dismiss the truth of it. As Christians in the 2000s, we have become so comfortable we have been rocked to sleep and we're not teaching obedience anymore Tuesday nights what we're talking about in there is stuff about how how you view everything through a biblical perspective it's, it's kind of like this you're put we're putting if I had to describe it kind of you're putting Christianity on legs you're saying how do I do this and it's very very application of course there's biblical teaching but it's it's also the application of it and when I see lights turn on in there, you know, people's eyes, you see, oh, that makes sense. Why? i got to be honest with you. S some of us are more concerned about watching Matlock that night than we are getting discipled. Some of us are more concerned about Monday night football than we are getting taught how to teach a Sunday school class. And yes... This is conviction, and yes, may it start in the house of the Lord. But do you really think that we're living out the Christian thing? Are we getting the most out of the church thing when we pick and choose, like we're in Subway, what to put on the sandwich, and we never put anything on the sandwich that's going to challenge us? God calls us to obedience. And one of the hardest times to be obedient is during the time of discouragement. We all face them. F.B. Myers, he, he, he was a um, guy who had preached and taught in England. He also preached over here in the United States. 
uh, really to Asia, to Africa, Canada, I mean, all these places. He was a friend of D.L. Moody, if you've never heard of him. F.B. Meyer authored many books, a great, uh, great man of God. He said this, when God beckons you forward, he is always responsible for the transport. It's not a thing about can you get there. God's going to get you there. Something I don't have a lot of time to go in and teach because my time is, is, is really limited. But when it says that Samuel went, you have to understand his life was on the line because people were going to be questioning why he had gone there. They literally were going to ask him when they see him, have you come in peace? Because they knew he would deliver God's message. And they knew they had sinned. Samuel even asked God, how, how am I going to do this? They're going to take my life, God. But he went. Sometimes God will place us in a spot where it looks so scary and so dark. And he'll call us to continue to walk because we're told the just shall live by faith. We're told that we should walk by faith, not by sight. And you find that when you're in the most scary of moments or the most fearful dreadful of situations you find out that under your feet the entire time was solid ground if you're discouraged you understand this Christ is our firm foundation I want to give you the words to a popular song that many of you have sang multiple times but I want you to think about it in light of this when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. The second stanza says, Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. The third stanza says, Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. The fifth one is the one that really stuck out to me this week. So we're skipping the fourth and going to the fifth stanza. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Never, ever undervalue obedience, even in times of discouragement. Times are good when times are tough. There's so much more I wanted to be able to say about this, but um, to sum it up, Psalm 84, 12 says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. We're living in a time here in the 2000s where compromise is applauded and accommodation is always expected. It may be smart for us to remember, though, that this is not the truth in all things. I'll give you, for instance, the pilot of an airplane who's headed for a city that's across the ocean. His radio compass has many potential uh, headings to it, but only one will point him to his desired direction. When he nears that airport, no broad-minding or compromising approach will do his passengers are not looking for the pilot to be open-minded or to debate with the control tower over when to go, where to go, or, well, can't you tell somebody else to move, that's my parking spot kind of stuff? They expect him to listen closely to the one in charge and obey the instructions totally to get them safely landed to their destination. The Bible and the Holy Spirit are our compass and guide in life, and we do not have room to argue and to debate with the one who is in charge. We will never land safely where we want to go if we do that. Where he, what he says we will do, where he sends, 
we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, we're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to ask our praise team to come forward and our prayer warriors. It may be that you today would like someone to pray with you. You're going through that discouragement and you want somebody to intercede on your behalf and say, help, help me God to be obedient. There's nothing wrong with humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. Let us pray with you. You don't even have to give all the story. You can if you want to. But maybe you never got to a point where you surrendered and said, I'm going to be obedient to Jesus Christ. I want him to be my Savior. I want him to be my destination. I want him to be my guide. Today, understand this. Jesus Christ died and rose again so that you could be saved. And it's his grace through faith. We can walk you through that process. But giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it does require obedience. Uh, you're going to mess up sometimes. But his grace is so full. It's, it's, it's new every day. His faithfulness is so wonderful. And I'd encourage you, if you do not have a good church home, a good Bible-believing church home, and you want to link arms with someone, uh, a body here who is trying to win this community, we're trying to do it right. Imperfect, but trying to do it right. Know this, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you join up with us and, and be on mission with us for what God has for us, trying to walk in that obedience. If God is so placing it on your heart, which is asking you during this time, during this hymn of invitation, if you would, to come. Heavenly Father, I pray that during this time of invitation that your will would be done. I pray that you'll take this message, help us to trust and obey. God, there's a point where you told Samuel to go. And he went. And you, take, you took care of the entire matter. And I believe, Heavenly Father, you're calling us to go. And I believe that you'll take care of it. I may not know exactly how, but I believe you will. And I pray that you'll strengthen, that we would all obey, even in times of discouragement, in times of good, whatever the case may be. Help us, Heavenly Father, to trust and obey. We pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen.